Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Today's broadcast is going to be a mind blower, no doubt about it. We're going to be looking at Isaiah 9, Isaiah chapter 11, uh, excuse me, Daniel chapter 11, as well as the book of Matthew. And you're not going to want to miss this. Pull up a seat, grab your Bible, get ready. If you're in the KJV Bible, keep in mind we may be off a of verse because we're using Hebrew translated literally out to the side here, uh, which also I think even the Septuagint is about the same as what you'd have in KJV. I've uh, done a lot of research here, and I'm sure it's going to be a blessing. Spent many, many hours trying to put this together once the Lord had revealed some powerful things to me here. Uh, but it's, it's going to be a shock to you. I can guarantee you that. Uh, anyway, let's get started here, and we'll begin in Daniel, excuse me, Isaiah chapter 9. This is after the prophecy of the Messiah, where it speaks about unto us a child is born, uh, and, you know, he'll be called the Counselor, Prince of Peace, and the Mighty God, El Gibor. All right, we're going down further, and what you'll find, though, keep in mind, Scripture generally, sometimes, one chapter can span hundreds, if not thousands of years uh, in time, the way the prophecy will fulfill. Now, because I get re reports sometimes, people say, Steve, you know, you're a teacher, but you're teaching wrong because you didn't read the rest of the verse, and that has to do with this or has to do with that. I, I think I follow the same pattern that Jesus, when he was here and taught, because he took the book of Isaiah, Yeshayahu, verse 61, he read verse 1 and half of verse 2, and then he closed the book, and he sat down, or he so it said to the people, this day, this scripture is fulfilled within your hearing. Why didn't he read on down? Well, you know, it was fulfilled only verse one and a half of verse two. The rest of verse two was a future event uh, with the coming of the Messiah, with the redemption of Israel, with the two witnesses coming, and totally has nothing to do uh, with what he was doing at that time. So one verse fulfilled and half of the other verse fulfilled 2,000 years ago, but it would be 2,000 years later that the rest of Isaiah 61 verse 2 would be fulfilled, where judgment is brought forth. He didn't come to bring forth that judgment. And this is why most of the Jewish rabbis get it wrong. They say, well, he was supposed to bring in peace. He was supposed to crack down on all the world there. No, 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 no. That was for his future coming, and he said it himself by cutting the verse off halfway through the verse. I think it's powerful. All right. So he moved on down, though, into Isaiah. We're going to start up here in verse 13. It says, Therefore the Lord doth cut off from Israel head and tail, palm branch, rush in one day. Wow. But what has this all got to do with anything? Let's take a look at what the head and the tail are. That's what's interesting in the prophecy. Now, we're reading here, the elder and the man of rank, he is the head, and the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail. For they that lead this people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. And that's pretty serious, friends, and what you're about to find out is a lot more about the elder and the man of rank. All right, now, here's where the problem comes in, though. All right, we have Zakin. Zakin is elder or aged or ancient. Three different ways you can look at this word in Hebrew. Unasupanim hu harosh. All right, so, and, by the way, I don't, I can't say, this is not correct when they say, and the man of rank. Makes no sense to translate it that way. I think even the King James Version is similar to that, all right? Because panim is faces, unasu is to lift up, or what could it else could it be? Just like it is in Daniel 11, to marry. Remember, and let's jump over that. We're going to look at that real quick here, all right? Follow me closely here. Ubatam hahem rabim a a a. And by the way, in, it says here, in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Do you realize that this word right here, Ubatim, is in the times past? 
not in those times but in times past there were many that stood up against the king of the south the king of the Negev the Israeli kings there has always been those that have come against the Israeli kings right always has happened so it's literally in the past there's many that have stood up against the king of the south but then he goes on to say Ufne paetzi amcha doesn't say also we don't have the word also there but it says and the children or the sons of the lawless of your people whose people Daniel's people the lawless of your people inasu laham lahamid hazon they will lift up or marry the vision what vision is it speaking about Daniel 9 chapter 9 and I don't have that up there but you know what we need to just pop this up here because we've got to have it friends so that everybody knows right where we're coming from on the entire prophecy here Daniel chapter 9 we drop down here don't forget there is one that is rising up all right 70 weeks are decreed upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression to make an end of sin and to forgive iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up what the vision and profit and to anoint the most holy wow to seal up the vision and profit you know that's something that always bugs me how do you what does it mean to seal up the vision and prophet and the anoint the most holy place know therefore and discern that from the going forth of the word to restore it and to build Jerusalem into an, an anointed excuse me one anointed a prince now that's the Mashiach because that's what the word is right there Mashiach Ad Mashiach Nagid an anointed prince see Shvim uh, Sha Sha Shavuim, Shava, 70 of weeks, Ishavim, Shashim, all right, and, and for three score and two weeks it shall be built again with a broad place and a moat, but in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall an anointed, a Mashiach Nagid, again, be cut off. But it doesn't use a Nagid at that time there because it's just the Mashiach. All right, he'll be cut off. Ikaret Mashiach. He, the prince, will be cut. He'll be cut down, cut off. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city. And see, that's a different one now. Watch out there. See, that anointed one is cut off. Just like you read in Isaiah 61, verse 1, half of verse 2, he's cut off. Come on, you rabbis, wake up just a little bit and get some eye salve for your eyes so you can see. It's a doggone blind, you don't even know what you're doing. And But what you, you know what you are doing? You're accepting that false prince instead. And the people of a prince, of a prince, Nagit, shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The Ro What people? What people destroyed the city and the sanctuary? The Romans. The Romans did it. Oh yeah, they used the Syrian military at that time. Why? Because Rome, 50 years before the fall of Jerusalem, they had already conquered the Syrian military, overtaken it, and now they were under Roman control, just like they're doing today. History is repeating itself, friends. Rome is taking down Syria. You don't think so? They're the ones in the background. Don't you worry. Now I realize you have a, you have a, 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 a shadow government in the United States, just like you have a shadow government in Europe. You have the elites running it. You got alien demons out there running it. Okay. I know some people don't like this. You can only be possessed of a demon. Well, you know, Paul said you fight against uh, principalities and powers of wickedness in high places. You don't even see it. You have no idea what you're fighting against. It's not just flesh and blood, but principalities. You had to look at that in the Greek one time. That'll make your head spin around a few times. But anyways, that prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, but his end shall be with a flood. And in the end, war of desolations are determined. So what is the vision that they're trying to marry or establish? They're trying to actually bring about this part here in Daniel uh, 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 chapter 9, verse 24, 
They want to, to decree upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, and to forgive iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. That's the vision they're trying to marry. Remember, I quoted Joel Bainerman from Red Moon Rising. That's on Barry Chamish, the late Barry Chamish's website there, where he quotes both, uh, Joel Bainerman saying that the, that the Vatican's desire is to unite the three monotheistic religions. Now, that's not Christianity. That's Catholicism, Judaism, and Islam. And he's been very successful in doing that, guys. Very successful. You don't believe it? Take a look right here. Sure he has. The article itself. Wait a minute. thought I had the article. All right, but here's your article on that. Pope Francis makes moves towards a, a, a midi with Islam. Got right there at the Wailing Wall. An Islamic cleric, a Jewish rabbi, and the Pope of Rome marrying the vision. Daniel 11. And the sons of the lawless of your people, by the way, that uh, had a lot to do with Shimon Perez, who is the architect of bringing in Rome. He, he would, who, Shimon Perez, the modern day Ahab that married Jezebel. That's why it says they will try to marry the vision. Inasu, the Hamid Hazon. Okay? but they shall stumble. They're not going to be fully successful. All right, so let's back up, because this is dealing, friends, you gotta really pay attention. This is prophecy speaking about what's happening in the Middle East today as well. So the elder, all right, Zakia, Zakin, una supanim hu harosh. All right, literally the best way to put this is this Zakin, this ancient, okay, this ancient, Unasu is either going to lift up the faces. He's the head. Who's the head? The elder. He's lifting up those faces. Now, could that be someone behind the Vatican itself? Because I'm thinking that the marrying the faces is what's bringing together Catholicism, Judaism, and Islam together. They're lifting up or marrying the faces, the leaders. And you could go beyond that. You could even go to the leaders of the world. All the leaders of the world go to Rome. All of them do. Right? They all go there. But that elder is the head. Una vi more shaker. And the prophet teaches lies. Okay, they got, they got men out there that are taking biblical teachings here and they're teaching you that this is exactly the plan of Almighty God. It's not the plan of God. Do you really think that when we see the prophecy about Yeshua over in Revelation that he'll rule the, the nations with a rod of iron, that he is going to go do it with missiles and stuff? No. But I guarantee you one thing, as they try to marry the vision, they think that the way to do it is to conquer anybody that don't agree with them, and they're taking their rod of iron, and they're destroying all their enemies that get in their way. And then you fight against, not against flesh and blood. All this flesh and blood battles that are going on, this has nothing to do with the flesh and blood. That's because somewhere, maybe even amongst the nations themselves, there's some demonic forces at work that are controlling what happens on the earth. That's where our battle really is. All right? Now, now watch what happens. So the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. Well, you know who wags the tail, don't you? The head of the dog does. So if it's got a tail, it must either be a dog or a dragon. I would say probably a dragon. Kind of goes along a little bit with Revelation, don't you think? There's some interesting things in the book of Revelation that talks about those faces and dragons and beasts and everything else. For they that lead this people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. For they that lead this people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. So go right ahead and follow in all this nonsense. Go right ahead and join back up into Rome. And you'll be destroyed right along with it. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither shall he have compassion on their fatherless and widows, or everyone is, a, excuse me, for everyone 
is ungodly and an evildoer. And every mouth speaketh wantonness. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is still stretched out still. For wickedness burneth as a fire, as devoured the briars and thorns, yet it kindleth in the thickets of the forest, and they roll upwards in a thick cloud of smoke. Now I'm going to get into some more of this in just a moment, but let me just share something with it that made me think about this too. When I thought about the ancients there, or the elder, uh, and how that they marry the faces or lift up the faces. If you take it from the standpoint of, the, of using the word to lift up, that's why they actually use the word the man of rank. Okay. By the way, if you were to spell the word man, it's enosh. Total, I mean, you, this kind of looks a little similar, but it's not spelled at all the same way. That's why you cannot use the word for man. In fact, the word man is not in there. Ish, Adam, uh, human being, none of those words are there. But they do put in there the man of rank. The word man is not there. Rank, you could say that because in the case of uh, what we were looking at here, let me back up to it again here just for a moment here. Go back up to verse 14. Uh, una, uh, una su, and remember, it's a, it's a sin, not a shin, because in the human being it would be a shin. Uh, but like I said, it's spelled different. It would be alaf nun uh, vav shin is how you say a, a human or a person. All right, so it's not that. But that's where they get the word for rank. Panim, but it's lifting up the faces, and it wouldn't be one man if you were to put man, you'd have to put men, it'd be, you know, uh, totally different altogether, that's why I'm saying, the translation is just not good, in this case here, zaken unasu panim, so he lifts up these faces, if you were to say lift up versus the word marrying, because even in the case of Daniel's prophecy in 11, you can say they try to lift up the vision. They're, in other words, they're trying to bring it to fruition. Marrying it, lifting it up, either way is okay to use. So if we were to say they lift up the faces, it made me also think of what Satan said to Jesus. In chapter, uh, I think this is chapter 4, yes, and verse 8, and again the devil taketh him up into exceedingly high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, all these things will I give you, if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Well, what do you know? He didn't say that they weren't his. See, and he's the one that appoints all those leaders. Interesting. So all those faces. Now, I'm thinking, I'm leaning towards this being more not just the three monotheistic religions, but I believe it's also the world leaders. The elder and the lifted up faces, these are the head. But is that the fact that it's the head? Is the head the elder? It would seem to be so because who Harosh, he is the head, the singular, the zakin. Satan himself, the Antichrist perhaps, but he lifts up those faces. He marries those faces. I would say lifting up is a good way to put it as well. All right, but let's move on down though. Let's go back to Isaiah 9. Let's drop down to verse 19. And one snatcheth on the right hand and is hungry. It's talking about these guys. We left off of the in verse 8. Uh, Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land burnt up. The people also are a fuel of fire. No man spareth his brother. Isn't that interesting? This is what he does. This is what these, this is what these three that are, that these faces that have been lifted up by this uh, ancient one or the elder one. He's lifted up these faces and, no, and, and it says here that no man spareth his brother. And one snatcheth on the right hand and is hungry, and, and he eateth on the left hand and is not satisfied, and they eat every man the flesh of his own arm. Watch this. Manasseh, Ephraim, and Ephraim and Manasseh, and they together are against Judah for all this. His anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Now, again, uh, the word here that is used here, we, of course, we have Manasseh et Ephraim, Ephraim et Manasseh, Yachidav, uh, uh, which are together. They're together. Uh, Hema, which is they, the word for they. They are together. Al Yehuda. Now they put in here that they are against Judah. Well, it's actually the word Al is either over or upon. They are over Judah. Isn't that interesting? They are over Judah. And the Pope is 
got his authority over Israel and keeps the leaders of Israel in line and as well as the United States government has his hand over Israel financially and they keep Israel in line, don't they? They turn that, they turn Israel just whichever way they want to do. That's Ephraim and Manasseh. And you don't believe that that's Ephraim and Manasseh? Let me just show you something because Ephraim and Manasseh, they're an interesting article and I can't help but agree with this man completely. Let me just see if I can find out who he is real quick again. Yes, Nathan Lawrence wrote this article January the 10th, 2017. Who are the modern descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh? God bless you, my brother, if you ever listen to our channel. God bless you for what you wrote here. One clue to the answer to this question, it is not the Jews. Not the Jews of modern day. I agree with him. It's true he's right. Now, watch what he says. Genesis 46, 14 and 16, Jacob prophesies over Ephraim and Manasseh. While prophesying over Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, Jacob crossed his hands over the heads, making the symbol of the Paleo-Hebrew letter Tav. Okay, which is like the letter T, he says, which resembles a cross in the ancient Hebraic script and according to some Hebrew scholars, pictographically means a sign of a covenant. Jacob then spoke to the heavenly messenger, the Hebrew Melech mistranslated as angel, uh, okay, he says, who had redeemed him from all evil. Jacob then prophesied the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh would become like fish in the midst of the land. In the light of this prophetic symbolism, which present-day religious groups would qualify as having fulfilled Jacob's prophecy to the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh would be, which religion on the earth uses the fish and their symbol? Yeah, the Christian people do. Speaks of a messenger from Yahweh as their redeemer and as the sign of the paleo letter Tav, which looks like a cross. The Buddhists and the Muslims, the Hindus, even the Jews, no. Only Christians fits this in, in a magnetic Criteria. Many Christians are without a doubt the literal descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh. And those who are not, according to the Paul, the apostle, once they have, he goes in, you know, being uh, born as a Jew spiritually. Now, the point that he's making here, I think, is remarkable. Jacob says that they would be like a fish on land. And he, it's true. Especially Catholicism uses the symbol, symbology of fish as the Pope wears the fish hat. And the cross is also symbolic not only with Rome, but it's symbolic with the Christians in the United States because many Christians hold dearly the cross because the fact that our Savior, Yeshua, died on the cross itself. So, yes, that doesn't mean that every single Christian is Ephraim or Manasseh, but the fact that the descendants have intermingled and intermarried amongst one another is very much true. So what do we have? Rome and the U.S., part of the British Empire, also descendant as well of Ephraim, all mixed together. Fascinating, isn't it? So now as we begin to look at the prophecy, we find out that yes, Ephraim, Manasseh and Ephraim, and Ephraim and Manasseh, and they together are over Judah. And that, of course, knocks the old complete idea. Let me tell you something. My friends that are out there that are black brothers and sisters, I don't doubt that they're, you're Jewish at all either. I know that there are many black Jews. There's no doubt about that. But keep in mind, if you really believe that you're Judah, prophecy is fulfilling while you're not sitting in the homeland. But let me tell you something. There are many black Jews in the homeland as well already. So yes, we do have Jews that are in the homeland. Don't, don't get caught up in the, the craziness. It, it, we don't got time for the foolishness, friends. Just move on with God and, and let's get moving on. Let's get ready for his return. All right. For all this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is stretched out still. All right. Now, I think King James Version, I know it does. It goes on to the next chapter. So let's, uh, it goes on more verses, I believe. In fact, I'll tell you what, let's, let's jump real quick over here to the King James Version just to, to do this because I'm almost positive that it does. And uh, I want us to be able to see this in its full fullness here. Isaiah chapter 9. All right. And let's jump over here real quick because I think you have more than, yeah, you have 21 verses. 
Manasseh, Ephraim, and Ephraim, Manasseh, and they together shall be against Judah. For, okay, it's the same one. It's just off a verse. For all this, his anger is not turned away, uh, but his hand is stretched out still. Uh, I wanted to point out the point uh, in verse 20 of the King James Version, which is verse 19 from what I was reading on memory. And he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry, and shall eat on the left hand, and they shall not be satisfied, and they shall eat every man the flesh of his own arm. You know what that's talking about? That's speaking about the wars in the Middle East that are happening right now. Why? Because Ephraim and Manasseh are there killing their own brothers. Because remember, as I shared with you about Isaiah 17, the, the fortress for Ephraim will crash when they take down Bashar al-Assad. Because there in, in Syria are still remnants of Ephraim. Even though Ephraim's children went on, on out of that land there, the earliest Christians are the house of Israel. In that case there, the name Ephraim is synonymous with the house of Israel. Not necessarily the tribe of Ephraim, but the house of Israel. And the house of Israel, when Damascus falls, according to Isaiah 17, they will lose. They will, they will, they will no longer... <laughs> well, what is it? It's Ephraim and Manasseh. They're killing each other. That's exactly what they're doing. All right? So this is what we're seeing here, friends. Now, let's quickly, let's go back and look then at Daniel uh, 11, I believe is where we're at. No, yes, at Daniel 11, but we're going to drop down, let me get to a different one, uh, verse 40. And then it begins to make, looks, or it will start to make more sense. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, or push with him, okay? The king of the south will push with him, Imo, Melech Negev, he pushes with him, all right? And the king of the north shall come over him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen, not against him, over him. And the reason why we know it's not against him, because it says right here, plain as day. It's right there in the Hebrew. All right? And he shall enter into the countries. If he was going just against Israel, it would not be countries, plural. It would not be Be'aretzot. It'd be Be'aretz. But it's plural. Why? That's why I believe that when it says that, that they pu he pushes with them, that's when it begins to make more sense. When he pushes with him, the king of the south is pushing with him, and then they come over him like a storm. The planes and stuff, even carrying all the armor and the military equipment and stuff. That's why we see like this in here. It comes over him, all right, and backing up like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen. All right. If he comes over him like a whirlwind, and it's with chariots and with horsemen, it's military paratroopers dropping down the cars and their, their tanks and everything are dropping down to the earth. And with many ships, yes, they'll come in with ships and everything else. What? To do an attack and assault on Syria, Jordan will be in the battle, Iran will be in the battle. This is what Jeez, this is exactly what Daniel 11, chapter 40 is speaking about. Something that everybody has completely overlooked, all because the one thing that made, caught my attention is when it says right here, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. Okay? And when it said at him, I'm like, where in the world do they get at him? Emo, emo, you can't put the word at in there at all. Em is the word with in the Hebrew language. Ein, mem, im. The, the holom vav right here that is used here is him. He pushes with him. Then, and the reason why I know they did add him, they just changed the, they changed the word in English because it didn't make sense to them. To come, instead of saying, just like they did with the word al aliyav. Okay, they had to say it well against him. Why? Because they're seeing that the king of the north comes in with like a, like a storm over the, with, with chariots and with, with, with fighting soldiers and stuff. You know, but again, the Baratzol, the lands, it didn't make sense. None of it made sense with the way they were translating this in English. And so I began to really just look at it in the Hebrew language and I saw, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not the king of the south that's pushing against him. He's pushing with him. He's pushing at the king of the north to help him take down his enemies in the Middle East. And that's what they end up doing. 
But then we find out as well another oddity in the translations when we come back over here and we find out that this elder, uh, verse 14, maybe verse 13 in King James Version, Zekin unasu panim hu harosh. And we find out that they also are there fighting against one another. And we find out that they have authority over Judah. So the king of the north has to be either a king that is a British Empire, uh, uh, US, Brit US and Britain are basically one people. I mean, we just might as well face the facts. They are. Both our tongues are native English. We were established by the British Empire. We are a monarchy of the British Empire and Roman Catholicism. And they both believe in Christianity, but they have two different versions, even though the Catholic Church has finally overtaken the United States. We know that when they raised the obelisk in there in Washington, D.C. And of course, the three different governments there, whether it be the Vatican, whether it be the British Empire, or whether it be the United States, they all three have city-states involved in them. And they're trying to make Judah have its own city-state as well by turning Jerusalem into an international city. So it'll be four city-states when they get done, if they get done, because Daniel does say uh, that that vision will fail. I know, guys, it's a lot of information to take in, and this is nothing like what scholars have been teaching. But when we go back and we're looking at Daniel 11, uh, especially verse 40 right here, you can't help but realize this is an invasion in the Middle East. This is something that has been happening. It's not something that just happened, but it's been happening, but I think it's going to come in a much bigger wave in the very near future. So when we look at this, when we think about Armageddon and we think about uh, Gog and Magog war and stuff, it's a little bit different. The Gog and Magog war may also be a similitude of this. I have always uh, wondered if the Gog of Magog uh, isn't something a little different. But you know, I did notice the other day when I was looking at Gog and Magog once again of Ezekiel 38, I began to notice some of the countries that are joined in with Gog are the very countries that have been overthrown by uh, the U.S. coalition forces destabilizing the nations throughout the entire Middle East of the world. So I don't know. Still praying about these things, uh, probably introducing some of that uh, the, today. If you're watching, if you happen to catch Hebrew Nation Radio, uh, I work with Bonnie Harvey on a program there called Flashpoint. We're there every week on Sundays it airs. We record it on Sunday, so it's always fresh, and I think it airs on Wednesdays as well. So check it out there, Flashpoint Hebrew Nation Radio. You can catch it on the radio broadcast there. Uh, I, I know it airs all across the United States, so check it out. And don't forget, uh, we had our second broadcast on um, World Harvest Television that just came out. I know that would be a blessing as well. That will be posted on Israeli News Live here in just a moment. If you find the messages that we're doing here are a blessing to you and it helps you, we definitely do need your support, friends, more now than ever, because we're really trying to reach out. We have several different avenues that we're just giving it our all to get the message out to the people, to wake people up. Uh, we're digging deeper than we've ever dug before, and it's definitely a full-time effort. Uh, and too, if you've tried to email me or contact me, uh, just be patient with me. I'm spending so much time in study and preparation here that I get way behind. Even on AOL, one of my emails, I don't get to as much anymore because I'm getting so much correspondence in other places as well. I have 4,000 unanswered messages there. And so just be patient with us. I, I ask you to do that. But keep in mind, we're now airing on television in America. It's reaching an audience that we normally don't get here online. It's a lot of the older people watch there on television. I know the younger people do as well. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an entirely different group of people. Also on Hebrew Nation Radio, we record every week there as well, airing twice weekly. And of course, right here on uh, Danun Institute and Israeli News Live, our daily news broadcast with prophetic insights. It requires a lot of work. My wife diligently works in the background as well besides producing her work on Rise Up Children of God. And we can't do that without you. We really can't. And so it's not to beg money or, or to dun people for money, but all we do is we ask, if it's a blessing to you, and God lays it upon your heart to support this work. We really do kindly thank you for it from the bottom of our heart. You can do that by visiting israelinewslive.org or israelreturns.com. 
I'll post both of these links here on the video for you. And you, or you could go to our website, you can give there online, or you can mail it here to the Czech Republic. Now, we will be in the U.S. in August, holding special meetings there as well, visiting other places around the country for a couple of months that we will be there. Uh, so we hope that we get to meet you along the way there, but we also want to thank you for being a part of supporting this work. I'm Stephen Venner. God bless you, and thank you for watching. Shalom.